Yes, so we now come to the second chapter of part six. The chapter is entitled The Making of Industrial Society. This chapter focuses on how an industrial society is made, on the technologies that make it possible, on how this organization affects people's lives, and on the dynamic interdependence between industrial societies and non-industrial ones. So we will focus on three areas. The models and patterns of industrialization, industrial society, and the global effects of industrialization. Beginning with the patterns of industrialization. Well, we first observe that industrialization refers to the process of manufacturing goods with the help of machines. Typically, these machines are made of steel and are activated by a propellant. In the 19th century, this propellant was mainly coal, known in Spanish as carbon, and it is usually a, a type of fossil fuel eventually the main propellant became oil, especially in the 20th century. So really to start an industrial society at this time in the 19th century, you need an abundance of coal and iron. So we get to map one, the first map of this chapter, and uh, we admire uh, the industrial development at around the time of 1850, this early industrial development. We can observe where, are, where the exposed deposits of coal are located. We see many of them in southern England, in the area of France, uh, Belgium, Germany, uh, and the Netherlands. So this is the coal that is more easily accessible and obviously industrialists who want to invest in this kind of development want to go near the source of the propellant. So we have the emergence of industrial areas and we see that these industrial areas are located in the areas of Europe that are abundant in coal at this time. When, then we see the development of railroads. Of course, this industrial production is all produced uh, in, in these factories, and then it has to be shipped as merchandise to the people who will buy it. And so for that, uh, transportation is needed. And we also see that when and where industrial development becomes uh, significant, the percentage of the urban population goes up because people who work move often from rural areas to the to cities so they can work in the factories located in these cities. Of course, to really start an industrial society, it also helps a lot to have a few colonies where slaves work with no pay at plantations that produce the primary materials shipped overseas and then manufactures in the factory in an industrial way. So this is exactly what happened in Great Britain and her colonies, especially the colonies of the U.S. that became independent and also the colony of India, which continued to be a colony until the middle of the 20th century. France also had her colonies in Indochina. And in fact, in those colonies, the plantations of rubber trees were very prominent. And we have to remember that steel machines need rubber belts to function. So we can see there too the connection between the colonial empires and the industrial um, society, the evolution of an industrial society and mode of production. Mode of production. We look briefly at the technologies. In, 17, in 1765, we look brief at the we look briefly at the technologies. In 1765. Uh, we have the invention of the steam engine. The steam engine burns coal. It's made of steel and rubber belts. 
It compresses the steam that that moves the wheel and therefore can activate the locomotive on a railroad, for example. What happens with this industrial production? Well, the amount of production increases tremendously. The manufactured goods that emanate from these factories are much more abundant and numerous than uh, manual production would allow. So then all these, need, all, these, all these manufactured goods need to be sold. They need some buyers. They need to be transported to their destination, which is, of course, what incentivates the construction of railroads. We also have to note that industrial production is not very sustainable, as we know today. Maybe then people were less aware of this, but today we definitely are aware that this kind of production is not very sustainable. Why? By increasing production exponentially, it encourages excessive population growth. That's why when we look at the population of these past centuries, they always seem ridiculous to us. Yes, there is 9 billion human be beings on this planet, largely as a result of this growth encouraged by industrial production in the past century or s past couple of centuries. By burning coal and later oil or petrol, it rapidly depletes deposits and reserves. When we talk about non-renewable sources of energy, we are talking about these deposits. Once you have depleted the deposits, you have to move to another deposit, uh, and soon you can run out of deposits. Not only that, but by producing the need for a coal or oil-based production, it can cause the entire planet to go up in smoke due to global warming. So once the population has grown to this excessive amount, then there is a need for coal or oil-based production because we need a lot of these things that people need to live. And then the whole planet can go up in smoke due to global warming, as we are very well aware today. So that's the reason why industrial production is not very sustainable, and in a way it is not, as was believed then, a panacea for all societal problems. Now we are going to look at the factory system. How does the factory work and how does the factory function and what changes, what transformation does it uh, result in in the surrounding territories. Okay, so the factory uh, locates so the, the, the factory is a centralized location for production. Everything that is produced is produced there in that factory in a certain realm of production. So the workers have to move, have to relocate near the factory so they can be at work in the morning and they work very long hours so they can't really afford to live very far from their factory. So the workers move in general from rural areas uh, and territories to cities to be near the factories or in, in their locations. Um, it also so so one first effect on the territory is that the factory relocates workers. It also changes many many agricultural sustainable agriculture workers or other uh, forms of peasant uh, uh, activities to uh, to factory work. The population that dedicates itself to factory work is often initially a rural population. Okay. But then it also increases production as it also produces more alienation. Let's give an example. Okay. In an artisan form of production, one person makes the entire dress. I go to a seamstress, she takes my measurements, then she gets the fabric and cuts it and sews it and there I have my dress and the seamstress has done the whole process but in an industrial production one per person makes all the sleeves of all the dresses that the factory produces and so that person only knows that element of the whole production process this causes this often causes alienation in workers because it becomes very very repetitive work where the individual creativity has very little place. In fact, it's considered just a form of distraction. 
Another element of change is that, uh, you know, if my, if I, if my, my thread, you know, is produced by a heirloom, you know, I can, as an artisan, I can own a heirloom. It's not a very expensive machine, and many artisans own their, the machines that they use to produce their goods. There are small machines that enable their work, but are of a contained cost. But if the threads that then turn into the fabric are produced in a mechanized mill, only an entrepreneur with capital can own this mill, this huge machine. So many workers at the beginning of, the, of, the, of these industrial developments destroyed the machines. They really attacked the machines. They felt that, that you know, their lives were changing. They became alienated. Uh, they had to move around to wherever the factories were, and, and this was uh, the fault of the machines. This initial movement, workers' movement, was, was called the Luddites, the Luddite movement. Uh, workers who really wanted to stay with a more artisan uh, style of production and attributed uh, the, the cause of the problem to the machines. So how does industrial capitalism op operate? We have seen that these machines are expensive. The factory is expensive. No uh, artisan can own um, these machines or less, l even less a factory. So it is a capitalist mode of production because it requires a class of people who have enough capital to invest in these big factory systems. So the result is what we know as mass production. Mass production operates through the assembly line. Suppose that I am the seamstress who makes the sleeves, right? Then there is an assembly line where all the different pieces of the dress will be assembled until the end we have a complete dress. This, uh, this system of production can reduce the production time by 10 per, to 10 percent of what it was. So, you know, the production increases in, uh, in relation to time because of the machines. Then obviously those who have invested in these machines have an interest in assembling more capital because there's always a new machine that might be necessary or an expansion of the factory. So that in, uh, encourages the, the system of the stock. You know, companies have stock that others can buy as a way to invest in that particular company. So stock exchange, for example, is where these stocks that companies uh, offer are bought or sold and they increase their value or, or lose their value. So this system encourages monopolies. These are often called trusts at this time or cartels. Why? Because all producers, all investors, all factory owners have an interest in controlling the supply and therefore controlling the price. If they can all agree that the price has to remain this high, then nobody can break that monopoly. And often, often uh, there, you know, there are what the cartels happen. Cartels are what today we know as mergers. In other words, different factory groups band together so that they have a more of a monopoly of the market in that particular realm. For example, the Rockefeller family at one point um, controlled almost all of oil drilling. So they also, they also decided what the price of this merchandise was going to be. So as a result of industrial capitalism, a new class of rich people is made. And these are often called the nouveau riche, the new rich, as aristocrats would call them. In fact, the aristocrats are a little snobbish and they think, oh, no, these are just new rich. We are the old rich because we are the landed gentry. These are, you know, just rich, you know, have become rich very recently. But they became very rich. And in fact, it is known that when a family is rich enough that their descendants could afford not to work for three generations down, if there is enough accumulated wealth in the family for three generations down the line, it is in the best interest of that family to keep the money out of the economy, store it away 
so that it is safe and doesn't have to be risked in any capitalist enterprise anymore. So there is a class of nouveau rich that comes into place and they are very, very uh, wealthy and very powerful. So what is the effect of, in, of this uh, industrial system of production on the common people? Okay, one of the fruits of industry is the growth of the population. In fact, it's a, you know, the growth becomes exponential. From the, from the year 1700 to the year 1900, we observe that the population of Europe goes from 105 millions to 390 millions. That's almost a four-fold increase. The population of the Americas goes from 13 million to 145 million. That's almost, uh, it's more than a tenfold increase. Of course, that includes a lot of people who, who migrate at this time from European countries that don't have colonies or industrial production to uh, the countries of the New World. So we have to look also at the demographic transition. How does this uh, population growth happen? And here we will look especially of how, about to how this population growth affects women, women's bodies especially, because women are always the uh, one that carry the children in their wombs, and also the lives of children. Okay, so in pre-industrial societies, often we have a high birth rate but we also have a high child mortality. Very often in a family, where, for example, a family of a pre-industrial society, uh, a woman can bear up to maybe 10, sometimes 12 children. That means that at least 12 years of her life, of her adult life, are spent, you know, pregnant. And, and many other, you know, several other years are sp spent uh, breastfeeding and, and raising this kind of brood of children. High birth rate and high child mortality really affect women, women's bodies very negatively because um, high child mortality means that, uh, that a family will try to breed more children to have a few survive early childhood, but then those are bred in the body of the women of the family, of the mothers of the families. Okay, in early industrial society, the same high birth rate is kept. However, often due to better diets, there is a lower child mortality. So more of the children who are born to these women of the working class uh, survive into adulthood, which of course spares the women's bodies of all these excessive pregnancies and frees some of their time to do other things. Then, when we have late industrial uh, society, we finally have more of a low birth rate and low child mortality. So the vast majority of children who are born to the women of these working classes live to be adults. So there is a great advantage to women in this way, uh, in this demographic transition, because they, they need fewer pre pregnancies to form the families that they want and therefore they can spend more time being citizens and, and being laborers, laborers or sometimes professionals as we will see in the women's movement and how uh, things evolve. There is also an advantage to society because at some point the population becomes more stable. Smaller families and, uh, and a lower birth uh, childhood mortalities. Uh, smaller families and therefore more population stability. Obviously there is a very simple reason why this works is that in a, in a rural environment in the countryside where there is a subsistence economy it is not as expensive to raise a child because a lot of what the, the family consumes is, is produced in the family in the sustainable agriculture method like you have your chicken, you have your rabbits, you know, you have your little uh, patch, cabbage patch. So the family produces a lot of what it consumes and so raising one child, two children, three children is not all that expensive. But in an industrial system, everything the child needs has to be bought from the, the parent's salary. Okay, 
Another aspect of uh, industrialization is the urbanization and urbanization and migration. In, in Great Britain that we have seen is really the first hub of industrial uh, production. From the, in the year 1800, only one-fifth of the population lived in cities. In the year 1900, only one century later, three-fourths of the population lived in cities. And obviously in the urban environment uh, related to this industrial production system, there is a lot of pollution. This is a system that burns coal, one of the highest pollutants even in today's world. Uh, in particular, coal leaves that, that kind of black powder that enters the lungs and infects all the tubercules of, uh, of the lungs that allow people to breathe. So TBC or tuberculosis becomes rampant and at this time uh, medicine has not evolved antibiotics so tuberculosis is not really a curable disease. If you're rich enough you can cure it by going to a Mediterranean island and breathe the fresh air but for most of the people of the industrial areas this was not an option. On top of that we have seen that the relocation of people from rural to urban areas due to the, the, the factory system um, is uh, often results in people living in overcrowded tenements, extremely degraded environments where people often um, take sh do different shifts in the factory and they, so they share the same bed like if you know if I do the night shift I sleep during the day but then during the night there's another worker who will sleep in the same bed clearly this kind of uh, this this kind of um, degraded environment causes epidemics and cholera and typhus was ver typhus were very common epidemics at that time Eventually, in the late 19th century, governments, often you know, influenced by liberal ideas um, and by an awareness that if they wanted to support industrial development, they have to keep at least the workers alive, um, provide in, begin to provide the infrastructure that today we know uh, is a staple of, uh, of industrial society societies. For example, sewage, uh, drinking water, different pipes. That, that bring these to the, to the homes, and then recreational environments like parks, spaces where the people who work can spend their day off and, and have a, you know, a public uh, recreational space and activities that they can share. We have to consider that uh, you know, while the industrial production has its advantages for the people as well, especially when the governments do these public works that make it more uh, pleasant, still the people lose something very important when they relocate from a rural to an urban environment. Uh, the population lo loses its resources from sustainable agriculture. Not only, you know, in, a, in an industrial urban environment, uh, people, families have to buy everything they need, often from shops owned by the factory owners and out of their salaries, but they also knew, lose the knowledge, the skills to really sustain themselves with, uh, with sustainable forms of agriculture and food production, like say, you know, having their own backyard with the chicken and the cabbage patch. So there is an inherent loss in this transformation that we need to be cognizant of. of. Um, so, uh, in, um, so when we look at the society as it is transformed by the presence of industry, we look at a new dominant class. This, no, this dominant class is often known as the middle class and in Europe uh, the term bourgeoisie is preferred. Middle class or bourgeoisie. We have to remember that at the time of the French Revolution in 1789, all of these people, the, the entrepreneurial middle class or bourgeoisie, the professionals that make the, the infrastructure work, like the doctors, the attorneys, the teachers, etc., as well as the industrial working class and the peasant and agricultural workers, they were all part of one, of one state, the third state. Now we see that, uh, that this 
this large class, this all-encompassing class, has become separated in different segments. We have the middle class or bourgeoisie, which is an entrepreneurial class. Often uh, the owners of the means of production are in that, in that class, the capitalist investors. And then we have, uh, so they are business owners, they are entrepreneurs, they are managers. Then we have the professionals that activate the infrastructure, including teachers, lawyers, doctors. Then we have the industrial working class and the peasant or agricultural workers. And these become di distinct sectors of societies, or what the socialists will say are different classes. So now we will be looking more at the organization of private, personal, and uh, family life in, uh, in this, during this period of the Industrial Revolution. How did this uh, industrial production reorganize people's personal lives? Well, typically in the class that, that emerges as you know, the new dominant class, um, we have the bourgeois class or the middle class, we have a division of labor between men and women. Typically in this class, men are the provider. They are the ones who really take care of the economy of the family, of providing the income for the family. Whereas women are relegated to the domestic sphere and they focus on reproduction and on the realm of affections. In fact, the mark of being middle class at this time, or being bourgeois, is that one's wife did not have to work. So the home also loses its uh, role as a site of production, as say, you know, the sustainable agriculture that many families practiced, many especially extended families practiced when they live in the countryside. So it, it, it loses its, uh, its uh, characteristic as a laboratory, as a production site for the family. So it becomes the site of the emotions of affection. In fact, this happens because work now, productive work, is now done in offices, if you are a professional, or in factories, if you're a, a worker. Now, when we talk about the working class, namely the class that really powers the production in factories, we see that women in that class do work and often are exploited even more than male laborers. Women are exploited and children are also exploited. Why? Because it's easier to extract more hours for a work from and uh, pay for less pay from these less protected groups. Often uh, children are exploited for, for industrial works that, works that require a small body, and so these children's growth is often also stunted, as happened to children who are exploited in mines. Women are exploited as factory workers because they receive less pay, but then in the household where they live, they have no rights either. So a woman could work, for example, 16 hours in the factory and then come home and still have to do all the domestic chores and also be available for sex uh, if she was married because there were no uh, domestic violence laws at that time and women had no choice or even, you know, um, uh, no-fault divorce type of, uh, type of laws. So uh, what happens is that often governments who have a liberal, liberal perspective, a progressive perspective, design, design laws uh, against uh, child uh, labor, child exploitation, uh, and institute public mandatory education so that it becomes clear that exploiting children as laborers is against their development because that is a time when, when they need to grow and become educated. Obviously, not everyone agrees to the, to, in, to the way things are going with in industrial development. In fact, a major source of political dissent is socialism. And we're not going to go into a whole lot of details about this ideology. We are simply going to examine a little bit the experiments of experimental um, the, the, the as, certain aspects of very experimental socialism, also known as utopian socialism, because it was implemented on a small scale. Many enlightened uh, 
factory owners or capitalists really created these mini societies where the benefits of the of the production of the industrial production were shared. Robert Owen was one in England, for example, um, Charles Fourier in France. So this eventually became known as utopian socialism, but it was actually a form of experimental socialism that had the only problem that it was done on a small scale. The difficulty was expanding the scale of these practices, of really sharing, you know, with workers, with those who made the wealth of the industrial production possible, sharing that wealth with them. So eventually two figures, two collaborators emerged as uh, those who were able to put it all this thinking together around socialism. And these are Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. They were co-authors of two very important books of the 19th century that really uh, had a, a tremendous impact of, on the thinking of the age and even on the 20th century. One is Das Kapital or the Capital and, and that is really a very voluminous treaty that, that is uh, a study of capitalism, a scientific study of capitalism, its merits and its problems. And then the Communist Manifesto of 1848, which is really like a pamphlet that makes, puts it all in a nutshell and makes it a lot more understandable to common people who clearly don't have the time to read, uh, to read the, the tomes of the capital. Uh, and uh, so uh, Marx and Engels claimed that their socialism was scientific. In other words, that they had studied the whole thing the, and, and all its aspects, the social, the economic, the personal, well enough that you know, they could claim that their theory of socialism was, uh, was scientific. It is important to notice that of the two, Marx and Engels, Engels, first of all, Engels was the one who supported Marx in his studies because he had more family wealth, but he was also the one who really questioned not only the industrial mode of production per se, but also the way the family was organized around private property. He had very radical ideas about family, private property, and the state, which is what we will see in one of our readings related to this age. So what was the main point of this, the study of capitalism that Marx and Engels made? They, they focused on something called surplus value. What is the surplus value that the investor gains from ownership of the means of production? You know, what Robert Owen would share with the workers in his sort of experimental utopian uh, ex socialist experiment is the surplus value. Most owners wouldn't do that. They would pay a salary, so that would be the workers pay, and then they would keep all the profits. So this difference between the, what, what uh, the owners of the means of production pay the workers in salary and the profit from the overall profit from that production, including of course the maintenance and the technological improvements, were the surplus. The difference between these two is the surplus. So what Marx and Engels claimed is that the accumulation of surplus value in the hands of those with the capitalist means to invest in the first place made the rich richer and the poor poorer. And that was absolutely true. So they felt that there was a need to redistribute the surplus value according to the needs of the workers and to the needs of the population by and large. They also, they also had a vision of history as class struggle, which really came from idealistic philosophy, philo philosophers, uh, German philosophers like Hegel, okay, that saw, you know, sort of this continuous evolution as a result of thesis and thesis and synthesis. So, uh, history is a class struggle. In this vision, Marx and Engels claimed that there was a new, in a new revolutionary class. The revolutionary class that had powered the French Revolution was now a dominant class, the bourgeoisie or middle class, the entrepreneurial class, the nouveau rich. Okay, so now a new revolutionary class was forming and what did they call this revolution, this new revolutionary class, according to them, it was the proletariat, the proletariat. This word means somebody who 
owns nothing except their children. Prole is the Latin word for children. So the proletariat was the class of industrial workers who often didn't own the places, the tenements where they lived. They had lost whatever little property they might have had in their uh, previous rural locations to go to the city and work for the factory owners. So all they had really was the children that were born in the families, the nuclear families that they had formed in, in the cities where they had migrated. So uh, Marx and Engels claimed that this class had the potential to power the next revolution that they hoped would happen, especially in the countries that had industrial development, including, I don't know, Germany, England, France, the countries of Northern Europe that really powered the industrial revolution in a, industrial, um, revolution in a big way. And that this class would be capable of over throwing the capitalist order. In fact, this didn't quite happen the way they wished because the first actual socialist revolution happened in the 20th century when uh, the Bolshevik revolution happened in Russia in 1917. So uh, things didn't quite go the way Marx and Engels had expected because, in fact, even the Russian Revolution did not happen in a country that had very high industrialization and wasn't really powered by the working class in, in Russia. Uh, so things went a little differently from what they expected. But still, they had a very good point that the accumulation of this surplus value had very negative effects because it made the rich richer and the poor poorer. So what did happen during the 19th century that was inspired by socialist ideas but was not a socialist revolution uh, or an, an over, a, a takeover of the capitalist order was a series of reforms. Many leaders in, in uh, countries that were highly industrialized saw the point of socialism. They saw that you know, socialist thinkers had very, made very good points. And if, if more, more and more workers would become socialists, then that, this overthrow could actually happen. And so, for example, in Britain, the franchise for voting was expanded in 1832 uh, any man, any citizen of the main male gender was entitled to vote. This was universal uh, male suffrage, which of course made uh, governments more aware you know, of the desires of the people because now these people were actually voting. They were a political constituency with considerable power because they were numerous. In Germany, we observed that Bismarck, the, actually the agent of German unification, also instituted medical insurance, unemployment insurance, and retirement insurance for the workers of Germany. So we see that the process of reforms and expanding participation and this sort of what Rousseau would have called the contra social, or what we today often call social democracy, uh, were beneficial and created more stability in the societies that were massively industrialized. The workers were also active and they um, founded unions. Unions were a bit of the equivalent, the industrial equivalent of the guilds of the Middle Ages. People who worked in a certain sector of the economy or in a certain factory would found associations that then organized action against uh, um, certain, um, certain practices of the owner or simply to uh, obtain better uh, uh, working conditions. And, uh, and often these, uh, these actions were strikes. Workers would en ma masse decide not to work on a certain day so the fa factory would be closed, the owner would lose money because there was no production and so eventually there was a negotiation and many of the, of the reforms and uh, uh, changes in the working conditions were obtained in this way. In a way, the reforms co-opted workers in the capitalist system. Um, they offered sharing in the benefits uh, and they amortized the revolutionary potential in the, of this class while they also improved lives. We need to remember that the whole factory production system still exploited 
the plantation economies of many countries that were still colonies and where often labor, agricultural labor, was not even paid because it, would, it was done by people who had been enslaved. Okay, so in a way with the unions we have two two groups contending. We have the alliance of capitalists, capitalist investors that form monopolies and cartels and trusts. But we also have workers across factories in a certain sector that can uh, form powerful unions that then determine certain rules that the investors have to follow. Last, we are going to look at the global effects of industrialization. We have seen how industrial societies are interdependent with pre-industrial societies. Because who is going to grow and harvest all the cotton that is manufactured in England? Right? Cotton doesn't even grow in England. So uh, they need pre-industrial societies that often exist in the form of colonies with plantation economies that provide the raw material for industrial manufacturers. So in, in, at this time, during the 19th century, these societies have, in a way, are a bit at a fork. Some go in the direction of development, and some go in the direction of more dependence. And so let, let's look at that for a moment. Let's look at the societies that go in the direction of economic development and see how they, how they do that. These would include for the 19th century, Canada, Argentina, Uruguay, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. Clearly these societies uh, have uh, their economies as, are based on the production, large scale production of primary products. Think of Argentina, for example, with the Pampas. They produce beef, right? We even here in Puerto Rico eat Argentinian beef if we go to Sam's Club. So they export large quantities of these primary products that they produce in vast amounts. But then, if they keep wages high, if they keep wages high, they will attract foreign capital and labor. People will say, you know, people who are poor, say in Greece or in Italy, will say, oh, if I go to Argentina, I will get paid just to herd beef, you know, to herd cows. And here I don't get, I'm not getting paid. So if you're a worker, um, you know, you have an incentive to say go to, to one of these countries that keep wages high. And at the same time, they attract foreign capital because their economy is active and, and, and is in the, in the, in the black. So, in, and at the same time, because, because the wages are high, investors have an interest in evolving labor-saving technologies. So that the production technologies will improve because there is a desire to save on, on, uh, on these high wages that they have to pay their workers. We are talking now about uh, the societies, the, 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 the colonial societies that in a way took this uh, road toward more economic dependence. Uh, these were societies that continues to implement a low-wage uh, policy. So they were plantation economies to begin with and the plantation economy is organized around the export of certain goods that are produced in massive, in massive amounts. But in these societies the profit was kept among a few owners. Okay? Because clearly the wages were lower, so the few owners could make a bigger profit. Okay. Then the population, the local population that powered the plantation economy clearly had a low income and so could not even buy any of the products that were that were uh, that were produced in the economy. And um, there were no incentive to really um, evolve technologies that were more effective because the wages were low anyway. And there was no input of capital or labor because people didn't want to migrate to these economies since the wages were so low and because investor, investors were a little wary of going to a country that wouldn't allow them to evolve new technologies and therefore improve, um, improve uh, the production system. 
So this is how, you know, the, this is how uh, colonial economies uh, differentiated themselves from one another in the 19th century. Those that went toward more developed, more economic development, uh, this, the, the crux of this was high wages and attracting um, foreign capital and labor. The economies that stayed in a state of dependence uh, that has come in, had come into being in the colonial, in the early colonial period, were economies that kept the low wages and continued with the plantation economies and the monocultures that uh, that powered them, and with uh, with really allowing a few people, a few owners, to make bigger profits. Um, if finally, uh, in in this in this uh, part where we focus on the effects of industrialization, we look at two, two countries, Russia and Japan, where industrial um, industrialization evolves, but it evolves without liberalism and without this practice of expanding inclusion, which we often call democracy. So first, we look briefly at Russia. Russia is still governed by the, an absolutist uh, monarchy, so the Tsar is the one who makes all the, decision, the decisions. An important Tsar of this period is Alexander II. Uh, he did many reforms. In 1861, he did the Emancipation Act for the serfs. Remember that in Russia still the people who worked the land were basically a property of the estate, so they were not allowed to migrate or move and they were, you know, if the owner of the estate sold it, they were sold with the estate. Clearly this was, this doesn't agree with an industrial economy because one of the principles is that people can move toward the factories. So the serfs were eventually, eman were emancipated in this act of 1861. Okay. Then he implemented the construction of railroads, the most memorable being the Trans-Siberian Railroad uh, completed in 1891, which really crossed the whole of North Asia from Moscow to, to Siberia. And one of the prime ministers, Witte, uh, went a long way to invite foreign investors in the industry of Russia. And when we look at Japan, we see that at this time, the, the, an actual emperor replaces the bakufu. Remember that the bakufu was a military authority. So now we actually have a, an emperor. And the dynasty is the Meiji dynasty. Okay, so the Meiji dynasty begins to, to really uh, implement industrialization and the infrastructures uh, related to it in a very fast way. In almost just one generation, it transforms the country, implementing transportation systems, communication systems, education, the telegraph, railroads, ships, and universities. This, of course, this, this uh, pace of industrialization is, uh, is very accelerated and therefore we have a lot of challenges to the families of the time that cannot really keep up with this very rapid transformation. So we see that in these two countries, uh, industrialization comes from the top down, is a top down process rather than an emanation of a new, of a new dominant class like the entrepreneurial bourgeoisie or the middle class. So, so we are now coming to the third chapter, part six of our historical uh, global survey. Uh, part six, which is dedicated to the age of revolution, independence and empire. Chapter 3 of this part is entitled The Americas in the Age of Independence. So what are we going to focus on in this chapter? We are going to focus on how the territories of the Americas transform and evolve alongside the 19th century, including the political dynamics of this arena and the diverse groups that populate it. They evolve as countries independent of Europe, whose societies are dominated by the descendants of the European colonists. 
We divide this, uh, the Western Hemisphere in three areas. We look at the northern zone of North America, which is what we know today as Canada. We look at the temperate zone of North America, which is mainly what we know today as the United, the continental United States. And then we look at Central America, including Central America proper and the Caribbean Basin, and also South America, Mexico, um, the Caribbean and uh, uh, all of all of the southern continent of the Americas and we focus mainly on three aspects in the political realm we really focus on the factor territory you know who ends up acquiring territory losing territory who controls what areas physically of the Western Hemisphere in the economic aspect we focus on one major factor which is migration the millions of people that came to populate the new world during the 19th century and on the social aspect we focus on the multiple cultures that became part of these new world societies and how they intersected with each other so we get to map one of this third chapter of part six and in this uh, map we can observe the super impressive expansion of the United States from a small country made of the 13 colonies that initiated the American Revolution and Independence War in 1776 to a vast expanse of land from coast to coast and occupying the vast majority of the territory in the temperate zone of the new continent of the Americas, considering that most of this temperate zone territory is really in the northern hemisphere. So how did this happen? And what are the consequences of this on the hemispheric and eventually on a global level in both the 19th and the 20th century? There's an important doctrine that uh, we need to remember in this context and that also has major effects that are very present in our island of Puerto Rico even today. That is the Monroe Doctrine. Monroe was a president of the United States in 1823 and his doctrine was America to the Americans. What does American mean? Does it mean all of the Americas or does it mean only those Americans who live in the United States right that's the big question so the effects of the Monroe Doctrine are often the following the American government says oh you are a uh, you are a colony seeking its independence from some European nation that is oppressing you okay we will help you we will help you get rid of your oppressors, but you become ours. In other words, you will become integrated to the expanding United States. And this happened on several occasions, including uh, Florida, Texas, even though Texas was part of Mexico, not, not Spain at that time. And then, of course, it happened with Cuba and with the island that we speak from, Puerto Rico. So now we are going to go, you know, historically through the century and see how this, uh, this uh, sort of uh, impressive expansion happened step by step. So we remember that 1781 is the year when the Constitution of the United States was written. Okay. So um, in 1783, already the 13 colonies duplicate their territory or more. Why? Because there were certain colonies between the, the 13 colonies that were now independent and the Mississippi, the central river of North America, that were still British colonies. What was Britain going to do with these colonies at this point? They included uh, the region of Appalachia and, you know, all that, all that region west of New England. So Britain decided to donate, to donate these colonies to the United States in 1703. Okay, then uh, in the Napoleonic era, 
we find that Napoleon, uh, who felt besieged, felt that his country and even his reign was besieged by the uh, old order of Europe, the aristocratic monarchies, the ancien regime forces. He felt he, you know, he needed to wage wars uh, all everywhere in Europe, and so was desperate for war money. And France had a possession in the in. Uh, in the territory of North America was called Louisiana. It went, it went from the southern city of New Orleans all the way north, occupying the central part of the continent up to um, the Midwest, what is known today as the Midwest. So Napoleon, desperate for money, sold Louisiana to the United States. It is known as the Louisiana Purchase. In fact, Napoleon lost a lot because of the, the, the decline of French influence in the New Hemisphere really starts from that and uh, got a little bit of money and the United States got a lot of power, territory and strength. Okay. Eventually Florida, which had still remained a colony of Spain, was acquired by treaty in 1818. Then what happened? There was a vast territory southwest of, uh, of the Gulf of Mexico known as Texas. This territory was part of Mexico, but many of the planters, many of the owners of plantations in that, in that uh, region were Anglo by culture, by origin. So they wanted independence from Mexico and annexation to the United States. So their pressure was put to the government of the United States and eventually the government accepted Mexico as a territory. This started the Mexican-American War. We have to remember that many of the planters in Texas wanted to be part of the United States. Why? Because the United States, especially in the southern southeast region, practiced, practiced slavery. And we know that the practice of slavery helps people not pay for the labor they obtain from plantation workers. So the Texan planters had a, you know, an idea that maybe, maybe slavery could be expanded and they could practice too in Texas. So um, the Mexican-American War continued for three years until 1848 and ended up with the victory of the United States over Mexico. At that point, the United, States, the United States acquired not only Texas, but all of the other region known as the Pacific Southwest, which includes California, New Mexico, Nevada, and Arizona. And of course, this was the majority of the territory in a temperate zone of Mexico. So it really amputated Mexico of a vast land and the, possibly the most uh, rich land that was part of that nation and that had the most potential for both agricultural and industrial development. It was a big loss for Mexico. During the Mexican-American War, another annexation happened by agreement with the uh, Great Britain and that was the annexation of the Pacific Northwest which includes Washington State, Oregon and some other states in the Pacific Northwest. So basically by the mid 19th century by the mid 19th century the 13 colonies had be, had expanded to a very vast expanse of land from coast to coast. In, and really, if you count the two previous decades, you know, it's a little more than half a century. It decuplic the country decuplicated its territory and its government got accustomed to the idea that every colony in the region that wanted independence from a European power, be it France, Spain, Great Britain, will want nothing but become a part of the United States. That's the equivocation still in our language today between American meaning person from the United States and American mean any people from the Western Hemisphere. This happened with Florida, with Louisiana, with Texas, Pacific Southwest, the Pacific Northwest. And of course um, there are wider effects to this and we will see them when we study the Spanish-American War which especially affected the islands of the Caribbean including Cuba and uh, the island of Puerto Rico, which is uh, the perspective that we come from. We have to remember that it had never happened in the West. 
since the time of the Romans that one country one nation would expand so rapidly, would debunk all obstacles, would acquire such a dominant position in an entire bioregion, in this case a whole hemisphere. It is not surprising, we can observe, that its leaders eventually became a little disturbed, that you know they lost their sense of proportion, right? They took for granted a whole lot. And this uh, idea of taking something for granted, taking that, you know, this expansion for granted and that it would continue indefinitely is what um, we find in the idea of manifest destiny. As if there was a destiny that this country was, was destined to dominate, to lead, to win. And this destiny was a manifestation of some divine power. Okay, and we have to go back for a minute to the Reformation. Remember one of the reformers, Calvin? One of his doctrines in Calvinism was that, uh, that salvation didn't happen by donations to the church or even necessarily by faith, but that it happened by predestination and that so that some would be saved and some would not and there was not much they could do about it. But that one of the signs of this predestination was success in earthly endeavors. Okay? If you were a merchant and you became very rich, that showed that, you know, that was a sign of your predestination to, to be saved. So we can see the connection between this idea of manifest destiny and this idea of predestination, as if this country had a predetermined destiny to become the dominant country of the hemisphere, and that this was kind of by some divine decision. Obviously, as we know, um, these kinds of phenomenal type of expansions do encounter resistance. Not everybody stands to gain equally, and not everybody is even willing to go along. Uh, this uh, process. So the US uh, government, the, 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 uh, the powers of the, of the United States, encountered three orders of resistance. Okay. First, resistance from the neighboring states and territories, in particular Mexico, of course, and Canada. Resistance from the indigenous populations of uh, the North American lands, including uh, the Native Americans, uh, Native American tribes like the Cheyenne, the Siu, the Apache, the Comanche, and many others. And finally, but not less, the resistance from the Africa, African people that had been imported as slaves and didn't see much of a gain in this expansion since, since it would you know, in many cases, just only expand their enslavement. Okay, so we look first at, at Mexico. Mexico is an important neighbor to the United States, and we see how certain dynamics are manifest in the 19th century to where really Mexico gets to lose what the United States gets to gain. So Mexico becomes independent of Spain in 1810. Okay. Then, only 35 years later, in the Mexican-American War, it eventually loses most of its rich territory, including California, Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona, and Nevada. Um, and we remember that it, the Mexican-American War started because of the Texan planters who said, oh, maybe we can expand, if we can become part of the United States, we can start practicing slavery too, so we don't have to pay for those agricultural labors. Okay. Um, Okay. Another area of resistance, of course, was in Canada. What happened with Canada is rather interesting because Canada, by its proximity to the United States and by an effect of this, uh, of this increasing power of, this, uh, of the United States, uh, got to get independence without a war. Why? Because Great Britain was highly concerned that every Canadian colony would go for annexation with the U.S. and was also concerned about this excessive power of the U.S. Um, 
So it eventually offered the Canadian colonies independence. So what happened? After the, the independence of the U.S., many colonists from the 13 colonies that had now become independent, uh, they were a bit nostalgic for colonial rule, and so they migrated to Canada, which became therefore more of an English-speaking or Anglophone country than Francophone country as it was before. Eventually, in 1812, the U.S. Uh, invades Canada. Why? Because the U.S. had helped Britain defeat Napoleon and now wanted payment for those wars. At this point, the Canadians resisted the attack of the U.S. They showed some national pride and said, well, we don't want our neighbors to invade us. So Great Britain got the sense that there was that sort of, sort of national pride of the Canadians and that therefore if it would release the colonies that they would become an independent nation that rather than become annexed to the US. So it promptly released the con colonies and, and that's, how, uh, that's how Canada became independent without a war.